Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring species roles and diversity. An important characteristic of a community and the ecosystem to which it belongs is species diversity. Species diversity is the number of different species a community contains, combined with the abundance of individuals within each of those species. The number of different species in a community is referred to as its species richness, while as the abundance of those individuals within each of those species is referred to as its evenness. Let's take a look at two sample uh, plots. In sample A, we have four different arthropods, a ladybug, a dragonfly, and some butterflies. In sample B, we only have two different arthropod species, ants and butterflies. Because sample A has more individuals, we can say that it is more species rich. Whereas spe sample B, uh, the species are much more even. There's an equal number of ants and butterflies, whereas sample A is much less even because there's an extraordinary amount of butterflies in that particular sample. Reefs and rainforests typically are like sample A. They have a high species richness with a low species evenness. Um, it's very, very diverse, but um, there's going to be some species that will be in great numbers, while others will be in small numbers. Whereas an aspen tree grove will have a lower species richness, just like sample B, but a high evenness. You'll notice the, how all of the aspen trees are equal in abundance. Now species diversity is going to be enhanced by geography. Species diversity is going to be highest in the tropics and will decline as we move from the equator toward the poles. Another way that uh, geography could enhance species diversity is with islands. According to the theory of island biogeography, a large island, which is close to the mainland, is going to have the greatest diversity. This is because the large size of that island is going to support more diversity, as well as its closeness to the mainland is going to allow for the greater chance of species immigration. Whereas a small island further away from the mainland will be less able to support that biodiversity and less able um, to allow for that immigration. Now, species numbers may also be influenced by the number of disturbances in an area. In an ecosystem, there are a lot of things that can be a disturbance, from a fire to a flood. The intermediate disturbance hypothesis states that the local species diversity is going to be maximized when ecological disturbance is neither too rare nor too frequent. If there are too few disturbances, then an ecosystem can be very stabilized and we don't get a lot of opportunities for new organisms to be able to work their way into that community. Whereas if there are too many disturbances, then the population never can get settled and we can never establish organisms that require a more stable um, environment. Species diversity is really important. What we found is that species-rich ecosystems tend to be the most productive and the most sustainable. If we look at tropical rainforests and estuaries, two of the most rich uh, species environments, they also happen to be the most productive. Additionally, these areas were going to be very sustainable because with the large number of organisms that are present, if there is any kind of disturbance, they're going to be more able to be resilient against that disturbance um, with having organisms to be able to fulfill the jobs of others if they happen to get lost as a result of that disturbance. The jobs that organisms do in their environment is called its niche. The ecological niche will describe how an organism or population will respond to the distribution of resources and competitors, and how in turn it will alter those same factors. In an ecosystem, some organisms are generalists, while others are specialists. Generalist species have a broad niche, and they can tolerate a wide range of conditions, whereas specialist species 
have a very tight niche and can tolerate only a narrow range of conditions. A panda bear, for example, is a specialist. Um, it can only be optimized on certain resources like bamboo shoots and leaves. Whereas a raccoon is certainly a generalist. It can live in lots of different habitats and subsist on a lot of different resources. In nature, you don't always get what you want. The full potential range of physical, chemical, and biological conditions and resources that a species can theoretically use is referred to as its fundamental niche. But unfortunately, in order to survive and avoid competition, a species usually only occupies a certain part of its fundamental niche. This is referred to as the realized niche. For example, there's a barnacle species called Thalamus that could fundamentally uh, utilize resources, uh, any component, any part of an intertidal zone. Unfortunately, when a second species of barnacle called Balanus is introduced, it is outcompeted um, in the lower tidal area, uh, forcing it to only realize a niche in the high tide zone. The reason why it's able to exist there is it's more, it is more able to resist drying out, whereas Balanus uh, requires an increased amount of moisture. As a result, Thalamus's realized niche is much smaller than its fundamental niche. Now these niches can be classified further in terms of specific roles that certain species can play within an ecosystem. Any species can play one or more of these roles. Two of the roles that species could play would be either as a native species or as a non-native or introduced species. Native species are those that normally live and thrive in a particular community. For example, a beaver in, uh, is a native species to Virginia. Whereas non-native species are those that migrate, or are deliberately or accidentally introduced into a community. A great example of that would be the nutria. The nutria was deliberately introduced into our area back in the heyday of the fur trade um, in an attempt to add another fur bearing species. As soon as they were introduced though, um, the fur trade pretty much uh, dropped out and so we were left with this uh, other organism that though it occupied a similar niche as the beaver, uh, it didn't do the same kinds of jobs or as well as the beaver. As a result, um, the nutria has become sort of a nuisance species. Some non-native species can actually outcompete the native ones um, and put them at risk for extinction. Another type of uh, species would be an indicator species. Indicator species are very sensitive to changes that take place in the environment. These can serve as early warning systems of damage to a community or ecosystem. Um, for most of the world, amphibians serve as great indicator species because different parts of their life cycle can be easily disturbed. Um, when they are um, eggs, uh, the eggs are clear so that ultraviolet light or chemicals um, can infiltrate and damage uh, the developing embryos. Uh, the life that they spend um, as juveniles in the water put them in uh, very close contact with any type of pollutants or problems that could be going with that aquatic ecosystem. And the fact that they must maintain a close relationship with these um, aquatic life zones uh, means that any kind of issues that crop up um, will become evident in the number and condition of our amphibian species. Another uh, role, set of roles that organisms can play is as keystone or foundation species. These terms are taken from architecture. A keystone is a special stone that's part of an arch. Um, it's what holds that arch up. If you take that away, um, then the whole arch falls apart. This is going to be true of keystone species. They are going to be um, fundamental in maintaining the structure of that ecosystem. Whereas foundations are what everything is built upon. Foundation species are going to be those that establish that baseline. They help to alter the ecosystems so that other organisms um, can build their lives on the environment that is produced by that foundational species. 
So keystone species will determine the types and numbers of other species in a community, thereby helping to sustain it. Top predator keystone species feed on and help regulate the populations of other species. Ecologist Robert Payne conducted a controlled experiment along the rocky Pacific coast of the United States of Washington that demonstrated the keystone role of the top predator sea star, Pisaster orcaeus, in an intertidal zone community. Payne removed the mussel-eating Pisaster sea stars from one rocky shoreline community, but not from an adjacent community which served as a control group. Mussels took over and crowded out most of the other species in the community without the disaster sea stars. The loss of a keystone species can lead to population crashes and extinctions of other species in a community that depend on it for certain services. Foundation species can create and enhance habitats that can benefit other species in a community. For example, a beaver serves as a keystone species by creating dams which maintain aquatic ecosystems uh, for other organisms. Elephants will serve as a foundation species um, in the savanna as they tear down trees and create mud holes which basically produce uh, new ecosystems to establish and benefit other species in that particular community. Having many different species appears to increase the sustainability of many communities. Human activities, unfortunately, are disrupting ecosystem services that support and sustain all life and all economies.